So open source is kind of broken, right? Well, uh, definitely, I think uh, there's facing a number of challenges. I think if you look at a, a variety of projects, even something like non-open source, like Wikimedia, there's been, uh, there's been an observation that the number of participants is in decline mm -hmm. on, on some big projects. Um, I think overall open source continues to grow, but, but it's, I think it faces some challenges. And I think you could argue that parts of it are broken and that we need to do more to fix it. And, and to really make it competitive, again, in, in an environment where a lot of proprietary software developers, I think, have responded to the open source challenge. So what is open source going to do now to take itself to the next level to respond to this, to both the proprietary software creators and the cloud? So you mentioned that number of contributors can be in decline. Is that the way that this brokenness kind of manifests, uh, you know, specifically? So, you know, I'm really interested in, in kind of two things. The, the first is, um, how, do we, how do we attract more contributors by making communities that are more able to ramp, kind of on-ramp people very quickly? And then once people are in the system, how do we reduce transaction costs and kind of crush them out of, of different parts of the system to enable their work to happen as quickly and easily as possible? And so those are the ways that I think we can, you know, if you want to say fix open source, but ensure that it remains competitive and that it's always growing and it's taking on new projects. And those projects have the maximum possible opportunity to succeed. Right. So to keep things competitive, you obviously need a flow of new ideas. You need to have a environment where innovation can flourish. Right. Yet we're talking about high transaction costs, which can you kind of explain what that means and how they mitigate against sort of innovation? Right. So, so one of the things that I, you know, one of the examples I've become interested in recently as I wrote a post called How GitHub Saved Open Source. And, and one of the things that I think is happening with that is, I think it used to be that with open source kind of forking was this, was kind of the F word. <laughs> you, know, you, you were not, you know, it was the thing that everybody was scared of. And, and it was really perceived as being the glue that, that kind of held everything together. But part of what it did is it also meant that um, there was a certain amount of centralization that everything had to kind of run through a central body in order to do a certain amount of exper experimentation. And what GitHub kind of allowed, I think on a certain level, is kind of infinite numbers of forks. Right. Now, and like the overwhelming majority of those forks would die, um, but it meant that people could come on and they could play with the code and experiment and then come back and make a coherent argument about why their change was good and why it should be taken back into the trunk or should be adopted by the community. And so it kind of, it took innovation and drove it into overdrive. So it kind of collapsed out the transaction costs of trying an idea out. Right. And it made it easier for people to experiment and come back. And so that for me, like, we gotta be looking for all the places where the transaction costs are high, where you, know, you have to seek permission or where getting a lot of people aligned needs to occur or where just like, you know, the processes are slow and we have to reduce those costs everywhere they exist across the kind of the pipeline of, of open source development. So talking about places where you need to seek permission and, and things take a long time, I know you've been working inside Bugzilla and one of the things that sometimes it can take a long time to get a patch going, people review, code review. It's a big established project. You kind of understand why, um, but that makes it hard for people to get involved and for new ideas to be heard. Right, so I'm a big open data geek. Um, so I do a lot of work with government. I have a chapter in the, the O'Reilly government book, open government book, and, and I've been kind of thinking about what, how we could be using data in open source communities. So I've been very lucky to work with Daniel um, Eisbanner at the metrics group at Mozilla um, and with uh, Dan Mosdale and uh, the three of us along with a couple other people have been creating dashboards to assess what's going on in the community of Mozilla. And the way we've been doing that is we've been scraping all the data out of Bugzilla, putting it into a, a database that's much queryable, and then showing what's going on. So we can begin to look at things like, okay, well, what's your, the quantity of patches you've made over the last 12 months? Are they in decline? Are they increasing? Or if you haven't participated in a month, um, like we want to know about that. And one of the things I think we need to start doing if, if we want to make, you know, if you really want to take your open source project to the next level is we got to start holding community managers and module owners and, and leaders in the community more accountable to some very quantifiable things. So rather it's like, do people like you? It's, uh, hey, you know, if these people have not contributed a patch in 40 days, have you picked up the phone and called them and asked them why? You know, is it, you know, the, is it, you know, that something's happened in their life that's taken them away or did they get frustrated? Because even if they're not coming back to the project, we need to know what got them frustrated because otherwise that data point's lost forever. And that means we can't fix the system. 
So I'm, I'm liking this dashboard because it shows us when we're losing people. So can we contact them? But then there's other places too, like code review. I have this, I have this hypothesis that a lot of open source projects really frustrate the contributors that are part of them because they end up waiting an unknown amount of time for their code to go through code review. Mm -hmm. So we're creating a dashboard now that looks at how long um, do, do people have to wait for code review at the project level, at a module level, at an individual bug level, and at the user level. And I think this does two things. One is it empowers users to kind of say, hey, like I've been waiting a lot longer than the average. Um, and so it gives them a legitimate reason to go and complain rather than just kind of feeling like they've been marginalized. Mm -hmm. Um, but it also allows us to hold module owners to account. It's like, why, why are bug reviews taking so long f in your particular part of the project? And what are you going to do to reduce that timeline? And then, of course, the other thing is I, I think actually we'll solve a huge amount of the kind of frustration if we just help people set expectations. Like when your bug kind of disappears into the black box of code review and you never know when you're going to get it back, I think people get frustrated. Whereas if you, if you know two weeks is the average wait time, then you kind of set your expectation, you're much more chill, and then after three weeks, you start getting frustrated, and rightfully so, and you should demand action. So you mentioned that you come into these ideas from your work in open data and open government, and where there's been you know, significantly more work on it. And I can see how an open source project is like a, a community you know, with, with, with governance and with interaction and so on. Have you seen you know, evidence of giving more information have this effect in, in kind of like a government setting with citizens uh, that you that gives you confidence it could play out well in the open source world. Um, so one one big example that I've seen is uh, is the uh, restaurant inspection data. So uh, in in the county of Los Angeles, um, they started forcing restaurants to publish restaurant inspection data on the doors of restaurants, and the moment they started doing that, uh, the number of people who went to restaurants with bad results declined, and the number of people who went to good restaurants increased. So all the right feedbacks got in place. So good restaurants were rewarded, bad restaurants were punished. The other interesting side effect was this, was that the number of people that ended up in the emergency room with foodborne related illnesses declined by, I think it was like 16% in that first year, and then six in the second year, and 3% in the third year. So it saved the healthcare system money. So there's like all the right feedback loops, and it's saving you money. And so I think there's a great lesson there, again, like for something around code review, if you made the data transparent and you put it places where people could see, people would start making better decisions about you know, what projects they're going to contribute to. Good projects will get rewarded. Projects with good governance will get rewarded. And those with bad governance will be forced to really think about how they're performing and have much more data about where they need to improve. So what stage is this work at now? Um, so in the Mozilla project, uh, we have one dashboard that's been created that kind of shows us uh, how, you know, the history of someone's contributions and when they've last contributed and the nature and how, how good their patches have been. So how many have they made, how many have been pulled out, how many have been merged, so which I think is some, there might be some interesting metrics that we could, we could use in there. Uh, and I know there's a number of other projects that have approached me and have expressed, expressed interest in creating similar dashboards. I think the key thing here is a lot of projects create data what we, need to get, what we need to do is get much more intentional about how we're going to use that data to drive behavior. So it's not good enough for you to have 10,000 dashboards that you've created. What you need to have is we as a community are going to use these dashboards to evaluate your performance. Um, and that's, you know, that's what I think most firms expect of their employees. And I think open source has this amazing opportunity to do that. Uh, and then, of course, we, who knows what, what else becomes possible. One of the reasons I wanted the dashboards in, in, a play, in an organization like Mozilla is I actually want to create an open data portal in Mozilla where you, where you start sharing all the data that is in these dashboards and let developers create their own dashboards that maybe will allow them to figure out ways they can, tr can contribute more effectively or where there are um, places in the, kind of the pipeline of development where there are problems that we didn't even see so then we can go and fix them. So I think there's a, potentially an opportunity for us to hack not just on the code, but on the process itself to drive out transaction costs and make it faster, leaner, and better. Well, thanks very much for talking to us. Thank you for having me. Look forward to seeing how this all works out. Thank you.